I'm a scientist at uh, Argonne National Laboratory, and uh, Argonne National Laboratory is actually run by the University of Chicago. Uh, it's out in the suburbs because the very first experiments that were done at University of Chicago were experiments that you really probably shouldn't be doing on campus. Um, so they built the very, the Enrico Fermi built the very first sustained nuclear reaction here on campus in a squash court. And uh, soon after, they realized, well, maybe somewhere really far away would be a good, good idea. Of course, far away now is just the burbs. Uh, and I work there with uh, about 3,500 other folks, and we study and explore science. We push the limits of what's possible with science. And we're going to start and explore what's possible with computing. Where are we with computing? Now, we've had calculating devices for a long time. Uh, even in thousands of years, the abacus, uh, the astrolabe on the right here, which has allowed uh, mariners to calculate important dates and understand uh, things that are necessary for, for navigation. But these are simple forms of calculating. They're not computing. These are, are devices which are shorthand help us with, with doing math. Uh, the slide rule, uh, and in fact, some of these are timeless. Uh, it, it appears that the slide rule is actually something we'll use uh, in the 23rd century. Um, uh, in fact, uh, uh, even though we have uh, uh, fantastic computers that can disassemble our bodies, uh, we always turn back to the slide rule. Uh, this is a young audience. Uh, uh, for those of you who don't know who that is, that's, that's that guy. Uh, so, but that's, that's just calculating, uh, really, the invention that has transformed us is the idea of computing. And computing is something else entirely. It's not actually about numbers. And uh, Alan Turing, uh, who uh, worked on cracking one of the German code machines called Enigma, was really what we consider the first computer scientist in articulating what, what computing is. And he devised, what's the simplest computing device that there could be? What's the, what can do just enough to be called a computer? And he devised this device here, this thought experiment that said, if I have an infinitely long piece of tape and I can just write a symbol on it, read it, decide what to do, and move one to the left or one to the right, that is what computing is. Now, the amazing thing is that that kind of simple computer can calculate everything any computer on the planet can calculate. Now, it takes more time. It's not very fast. But that concept of what a computer is, that it can calculate, has transformed us, that we now have ways that we, we, we compute things from that one very simple concept. Now, they did not create the first computer. He created the concept. The first computer, strangely, is actually something from maybe 100 years prior. Now, it's, it's not quite a steampunk computer. Uh, but it's pretty close to one. So, you know, what are steampunks? Well, the, you know, they kind of reimagine the Victorian era with uh, steam and brass and gears. And, uh, you know, this is kind of from a science fiction view from Jules Verne, H.G. Wells. And the actual first computing device was actually very much like this. In uh, uh, Charles Babbage in the 1800s designed a computing device that you actually had a crank here. It's not steam powered. Uh, this is the old days, you know, there's like a rosewood handle on this, right? And, and, and if you crank this, you could turn out computation. In this case, half of that machine was dedicated to printing tables. And the very first computer programmer was a woman, Ada Lovelace, who wrote in the notes of a technical paper what you might be able to accomplish, an algorithm for computing something. Now, this is the beginning of the revolution. This is what starts... And now, as soon as we switch to a new technology, we switch to silicon, now the world changes. We've gotten rid of tubes, uh, which uh, uh, now you can buy a tube, uh, but it's for a uh, uh, you know, $3,000 guitar amp uh, to get a retro sound. Uh, but the tubes are what gave us that first sort of one or zero, the first sort of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, switch. And now we have transistors, and now we are able to pack millions and billions of transistors onto a single chip. It's, there's nothing in our existence so far that comes close to the technological change that has occurred in computing in silicon. To give you an example, if this room could hold 2,000 people, that would have been 
2,000 transistors, that would have been the first uh, decent uh, integrated circuit, the first sort of computing, pretty good computing device, 2,000 transistors. What we can do today is fit the entire world's population, 7 billion transistors into a space that computes and that gives you uh, computation, that gives you answers. Nothing else has been this dramatic in our life. And, and there's a question, what can we continue to do this? Can we keep building gigantic supercomputers? Now, of course, one of the questions is, what do you do with a computer? Well, we're very fortunate in science is that our Earth, our planets, uh, the entire universe, it's created uh, 13 billion years ago, a big bang, and everything comes forward. And we have rules to how that system works. Those rules are actually formulas. And as scientists, we, we learn these formulas, and we can then use these formulas to predict things. So for example, if I want to predict what's happening with how fast a car, uh, what kind of damage a car might do if it hits something, or what the climate of the future will be like, I can apply formulas and put them in the computer in order to simulate, in order to project forward, because I know the rules of the universe, I can put that into the computer and project forward. Now, some of you are familiar with these physics-based projections. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, in fact, uh, it's probably best if we just do an example here. So uh, let's, uh, let's take a look here. Uh, we have here the, uh, the world's largest Angry Birds uh, uh, demo here. And uh, because we're, we're safe scientists, I will put on my safety glasses. All right. So what I have here is a uh, very simple device which connects uh, to the computer that's actually running the Angry Birds game. And the point here is that what we've done, what the developers of the game have done, is they've put the rules of physics, the rules of our universe, which are formulas, into the game. So the game is now simulating what gravity might be like. And now the birds are awake. And, uh, and, and, and what happens when something slides across another platform, when there's, a, when there's friction? So let's, uh, let's give this a try here. We're going to... Uh, See if we can get our, oh, there we go here. So this is uh, connected here to the uh, controller. And uh, I have an actual angry bird here. And I hope the people are in the front row there can catch if I, uh, uh, let's see if I can launch one of these. Not bad. I might need to, should I try one more time? All right, I have another bird here. Let's try one more time. All right. All right, where is he? All right, well, we might not be able to, we might not get this. Oh, the hand is moving. Oh, man, I'm not even moving it, isn't that amazing? All right, let's see here if we can get this going. There we go, one more time. A little higher maybe this time. Oh, okay, I got one of them, all right. So, all right, let's switch back here now. There we go. So what's happening in that simulation? We have scientists who have studied gravity, friction, momentum, velocity. They apply all those things into a simulation. So now what do we do with supercomputers? This is not my job at work is not to play Angry Birds. Uh, and we don't design supercomputers to play super versions of Angry Birds. Uh, and, and those in the front row were, I'm, I'm glad we didn't play Fruit Ninja. Uh, I would have had to hand out ponchos or something. Uh, so a computer is able to do the kind of calculations that I just talked about, gravity, friction, uh, all of the elemental forces. And we do billions of them. In fact, this kind of computer, this is the one at Argon, can do 10 petaflops. Now, it's kind of hard to imagine what that means. That means, like, if I ask someone here to do a math problem, you know, five times seven, you might be able to do maybe, maybe one per second if I kept rattling them off, right, to you. This computer can do a half a million, more than a half a million operations per second for everyone on the planet. 
So if all of you on the planet could calculate a half a million uh, computations per second, you'd not quite be as powerful as this computer. Now, we don't, that doesn't seem to bother us uh, that we have computers that can compute, that can calculate with numbers, but we keep speeding them up. And where we are right now, uh, from about the early uh, 1990s, every year we keep getting faster and faster. In fact, the fastest computer right now in the world is in China, the Tianha 2. It's about 33 petaflops. And Argonne National Lab just announced the next computer that we plan to get, which will be in the maybe 200 petaflop range. Now, why do we keep building these faster computers, and can we? Well, there's a, first off, there's a bit of a problem. The faster the computer, the more power it takes. So we have a problem with respect to the technology we're using now with Moore's Law and everything else. It's slowing down, but it's also a, a difficult power problem. And so we know <laughs> that uh, if something can't go on forever, it will stop, <laughs> all right? So we can't keep building computers that are this kind of speed, this kind of fast, but, but maybe we don't need to. So what we're doing with computing right now is mostly in these kind of big supercomputers, we're running these formulas. We're doing flops, floating point operations. And why? Well, we're, we're designing new batteries. Right now, there's no reason for us to drive cars that have gas or diesel and an internal combustion engine, except for the fact that our battery technology isn't very good. If today we could make batteries 10 times better by designing a new material in a computer, by designing a new material, everyone would switch. I mean, there'd be absolutely no reason for, for you to have to mess with, with you know, polluting gas and, uh, and uh, drive in to uh, gas stations. We just all switch. It's much, much, besides that, they're more fun to drive. Uh, so these are the kinds of problems that scientists are doing at Argonne every day. Climate change, uh, biology, uh, blood flow in the brain. But these are all computation problems that involve floating point operations. The applying those fundamental universal formulas that we understand. But that's not how our brain works. So our brain is a much different kind of computing device. And in fact, our brain uses a lot less power to do what we need to do. The supercomputer at Argonne uses, current supercomputer at Argonne uses six megawatts of electricity. A megawatt of electricity a year is about a million dollars. So that's a six million dollar electric bill. My brain doesn't <laughs> use that much power. I eat a, you know, a bagel in the morning and uh, uh, you know, a little bit of salad at lunch. Uh, you know, it's on the order of tens uh, of watts, right? So uh, it doesn't use a lot of power. So if we can change the way we compute, maybe we don't need to keep building supercomputers that are just larger and faster, except to solve those kind of physics problems that we still need those for. Maybe there are other problems that we can solve. Now, this has been happening over the last 10 years, and it's quite a remarkable transition for us. Most of you know about Watson, right? The idea that uh, uh, you can load two million pages of information, uh, human text, uh, into a computer and then have it answer questions. This computer is already being targeted by IBM to the medical industry to be able to load up every possible medical journal that we, has ever been written to load it up so that we can ask questions about medical treatment. This is not a computing in the sense of five plus seven. This is a computing in the sense of training with very large data sets. There was some group uh, at Carnegie Mellon who with the right sort of facial recognition software and polling the internet's data of Facebook pages, we're able to write an app where I take my cell phone camera out, I point it at someone, and about one out of three chances, it'll just tell me what their name is. Because your picture is already on the internet somewhere, and with the right kind of training program to categorize and classify those, you can find out, find out that information. So Alan Turing, going back to him now, he, he started this concept, this idea of what would it take to be intelligent? Now, we're not there yet, but we are beginning to teach computers in a way that we're, is not a formula. We're teaching it with training sets, with big, huge databases. We have self-driving cars. These don't need supercomputers. They need data. So what has happened is there are a set of scientists who are working on how do we teach computers 
to classify and understand data, not the same as simulation computation, but classify and understand data. So for example, being able to tell cat or dog. Now all of us here can look at that and say, yes, I, well for the most part, I think you can tell what a cat and what's a dog. And the way you do this with a computer is you train the computer up with these training sets. Now what's happened is that we train humans in schools and we only are able to train so many hours a day. For a computer, we are able to give it the entire database of all of cat dog videos on YouTube, right? So the training set can be quite large. Now it's not always easy to tell cat from dog. Um, uh, you know, I don't think that computers may, you know, will always be able to pick as easily as we can, but we can, with large data sets, really transform how we compute. So, where are we? We are able to build very large computers, and we will continue to build very large computers, although it's getting harder. Power, uh, faults in the computer, the technology we're using, Moore's Law can't continue. We know that it can't continue forever because if it can't continue forever, it has to stop, right? We can't keep making things smaller. So maybe the question uh, about can we keep building computers is not really the right question. Uh, maybe the question is can we teach them? And the interesting thing is that you, everyone here, is already teaching them, sometimes unwittingly. So some of you have generated a new computer account somewhere and you'll be given one of these things to type into a box to prove you're a human. It's actually not so much, it is to prove you're a human, but that's actually not the most important thing it's doing. You're teaching the computer what that is. They're using us, they meaning you know, really great smart scientists, uh, are using people interacting with the internet to train the computers. So when the Google car drives by an apartment and doesn't know what apartment number that is, it asks you. <laughs> and you answer, and the computer now has been trained. And so as the years go by, the computer, the algorithms, the data sets get better and better at understanding the world around us, understanding medicine, understanding text, understanding uh, uh, cats and dogs, visual cues, we're training our computers in a way that's much different. So maybe the question we have to ask ourselves is what are we teaching? What will we teach computers? What will we be able to train? And are the, what kinds of algorithms might we be able to develop? The world has uh, many difficult challenges. And the question I think for us, the incredible unknown, is what kinds of problems might we be able to solve by building tools, by building computing devices to then address the problems that we really have, to address energy, batteries, to address uh, agriculture, to be able to uh, 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 raise um, better sources, make better sources of food without leaving pesticides and other uh, uh, chemicals in the ground. These are all incredible challenges for us. And computing is one part, but the question I think that's really a challenge for us is how will we teach and what will we teach the computers as we move forward? Thank you.